Ibomane Genti, Aine Kenun or Zono Bosin Keta, Isipun Koyachiri, Yazelo. Once again, good morning, good afternoon, good night. It depends your time and your location. You are joining us today at Eastern News 24. I see Megachuko Kabiama, Polimi Yenine Gozuno, Nimi Yenine Biafa, and the Mazina Nakana Yapatan and Polo. He said, He said, He said, Okay, I'm a Fukun Sesarani, I name, I got up on you also, no Bosin Keta. In if I will lika, I will tell you nukuzi, nukuzi di okempa, nukuzi di okempa. Ma kuzi I will tell you nubo. Oh, when they can add out if a man odugu PM na exile, the man say money ba the be from Prime Minister in exile. If I can hear you, when they can add bamba. Ma na be fine. I will tell you nuna adozi ito. Or the first session and second session and then third session. So no no other part part one. Part two, part three. I'm gonna cut out part one. So stay tuned at Eastern News 24. I gonna make the I gonna make upload to part three of it. All right. The boys are in a jig. We have Mazin Nam the Khan and Mazin Simon Eba. We will leave for far. We will agreement for family. That be fair. But if you don't achieve go see ya, but no one can have ba Mazin Simon Eba. Ba. And if you don't, if you don't go see this audio. I will tell this audio on court to this part. Kabia France will get here. He get here. He buy a lot. Mazi Simon eh, but we are bad. Oh, man, he na bad man. He man he na na bad man. He na ni kanoku. Because I from the listen, I am a genie listen off more off more. Mazi na ni kanu wali yogo Simon eh ba. Before, a jidiya, gent na ya biye. All right, over to you, my able leaders. Over to you, sir. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, as you all have seen, we are being under uh, attack, and uh, finally, we are back. As we are going to wait for our viewers to join back, uh, we are going to go on commercial, which is very, very important. This commercial will take just two minutes before we start. We apologize. Because, uh, you know, when it comes to tech, anything can happen. When the enemies are angry and they are not happy with the progress that is being made on Biafra uh, restoration, you see what is going on now will be going on. But we are very resolute. Uh, giving up is never in our dictionary. And we are going to continue. Uh, on this note, we are going to start uh, this program based on three... Uh, based on three principles. Yes, so we are starting based, uh, based on uh, three principles. Uh, the first principle is the freedom, the freedom of speech. We are going to visit, uh, you know, the what the freedom of speech says, especially most of the international uh, laws about the freedom of speech. And then after that, we go to the, uh, the state formation, uh, what is being recognized as state, you know, what is the statehood when people, a uh, group of indigenous people or people uh, of uh, same ethnic uh, group are uh, agitating or wanting the freedom uh, or independent uh, or sovereignty state. We are going to go very briefly on that. And then the third one will be, uh, the third one will be on uh, on uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, international standard, the international standard of freedom of, uh, first, the international standard of freedom of expression, uh, two is the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, what uh, the IPOB has, uh, has filed uh, in 2016 to the uh, International uh, Criminal Court. This communication was done in 2016 by uh, Professor uh, Goran Slaughter and Andrew uh, Lunazi. Uh, you, of course, you, you are very, very conversant with that. And then after that, we start the program. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Why do we have to make references to these three issues I have mentioned here? Is because a lot of people will say that, uh, okay, what you have to do it this way, you have to do it that way, wait for international community to intervene and all that. But we want to tell them this evening that all these things they are saying, uh, IPOB under your leadership has done even more than expected. And there is nothing to show for it anywhere today. 
You have written to international criminal court. You have hired some of the best uh, uh, lobbyists all over the world. You have done all this, and today we are going to show it to the public for the very first time. The application filed to the ICC yes. in 2016. I know you'll be very surprised that I'm talking. Are you hearing me? Loud and clear, Simon. I'm yeah. hearing you. So go I'm, going, I'm going to I'm going to pull the application uh, IPOB under your leadership filed to the International Criminal Court in 2016. Yes. Uh, we are only going to read because it is about 93 pages. Mm -hmm. So when people when people are talking, when people are talking, they are saying something they know nothing about. They don't know how far you have gone with the IPOB, especially to get justice for what the Nigerian government has done to our people. So today I am going to release only one eyes, only one, only one tip of the ice bag. And I'm doing it for the very first time on this program. It is going to be on the screen very shortly. Because uh, this program is going to be completely different than what, uh, you know, normal, what we have been doing all this while. It's going to be completely different. And then also, if the attack is too much that uh, they couldn't allow us to do something or, you know, do it the way I wanted to do it, that what we have to do is that <laughs> we may have to reschedule and I will set up a Zoom because I'll be getting a lot of messages from different media as I'm talking to you right now. I'll be getting a lot of messages from different media, from different media houses. And they are telling me what to do. They are telling me to do this and do that. So, so if this doesn't work out, we have to now... We can have a discussion and then we can present the evidence afterwards. We can yes. have a discussion today and then the evidence will be presented later. To let us exactly, exactly, exactly. But I do thank um, the viewers and listeners for their patience. They've been patiently waiting and I can yeah. see that the numbers are back up again to where it was before we were rudely interrupted. Uh, but we must proceed. We must, we must proceed. proceed. Yes. So uh, before uh, before we go uh, forward, could you could you tell our viewers uh, a little bit about this application I just uh, I've just mentioned to you filed in uh, two thousand and sixteen. In two thousand and sixteen, our lawyers, should I say, our attorneys in Europe approached the ICC to make or to present a very compelling case about the human rights abuses being perpetrated by the Nigerian government against the people of Biafra. As you well know, Goran did a very wonderful work. That was in 2016. Also in 2017, additional work was done by our lawyers here in the United States of America. In 2018, additional work was done by our lawyers back home. In 2019, we hired one of the top human rights lawyers in the world to litigate this very matter before the ICC against the Nigerian government. In that same 2019, and as you said, for the, I believe for the very first time, I'm providing clarity on this very matter. I went to the ICC myself. I went to ICC myself. I was deposed. I told them exactly what was happening. They said we shouldn't discuss it when we go outside. And we've been waiting since 2019. We're in 2021. And instead of doing something about the, should I say, the very relentless pursuit of the African people, the Nigerian government has been emboldened, the zoo has been emboldened into killing our people, not just killing us. We have now arrived at a situation where our women are being abducted and raped in the north because ICC failed to do something for how many years now? 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019. We hired people in the Hague on a permanent basis paying them tons of money to be collecting all this evidence against the Nigerian government for the sole purpose of bringing this matter 
before the ICC, at least for them to investigate. But due to the overwhelming political pressure on them, they have not been able to do anything about it. The only reason why they issued some kind of um, statement a few weeks ago, or should I say a couple of months ago, was because of the NSAS protest. If not, they would have mentioned it. I am in the United States of America, where we've hired a very top lobbying firm at Washington, D.C., at huge expense, I must tell you. You also know about the submissions we made to the United Nations. Angela Kalama's report, everyone has read it. We went there, IPOB, she mentioned IPOB and Biafra. You can see that report on human rights abuses in the zoo. I have been to Geneva. I've sat down with United Nations officials in Geneva. I have been to the EU. Most of them have been to the House of Lords to make a presentation before the Scots. I have been to Capitol Hill here in the United States of America in Washington to present our case. So where else do you want us to case to take our cases to before something is done about it? These are the things that people don't understand. Most of the contracts, most of the work we are doing, you cannot see them. You cannot write about them or talk about them. If not for this very program, I won't be discussing this. But it's about time our people realize that we are doing all we can to present all this catalog of abuse and degradation before the conscience of the international community. But unfortunately, Britain is working for Nigeria. There is uh, what's what I call a climate of neocolonialism still prevalent in Nigeria, and they still see Nigeria as a contraption they created. They still see Nigeria as a place they can come to Biafra and take our oil and gas without paying for it. Therefore, anything that can sustain the false unity of Nigeria is what they are going to encourage. They see Biafra agitation as an antithesis to that very plan which they have, which is to keep this contraction together for them to have unfettered and unrestricted access to our resources. And that is what has been happening. But unfortunately, our people are not um, um, intelligent enough to understand. Every year we spend money. We have somebody in the Hague right now collecting all the evidence, the rape cases, everything, all the murders, all the unprovoked attacks and invasions, everything. But for ICC to call up that very case is another problem. When I say that Biafra is going to be the last miracle on earth, people don't quite understand what I mean by that. Biafra has not known the number of people and forces against them. They don't understand it. Those of us are the co face of the struggle, deep inside it. We know who our enemies are, and they are numerous. But I am very, very confident of victory because the God we serve is the one that made this very universe, and his words must prevail. And on that very promise, we anchor our hope, we rest all that we are doing to restore Biafra. And we know that in the end that Biafra will come. We have a lot of enemies, you know. We've not done anything to them. It's Biafrans that built America. We built this very country that I'm in today. Biafrans built the United States of America. The majority of all the hard-working free men and women they took from the western coast of Africa, they shipped them to the USA. They are the ones that made this country great. So they see something in us that we cannot see. They know we are very productive. They know we are hardworking. But above all, Britain knows that we are blessed. It is that blessing from God that Britain doesn't want to see rise up in Africa. And that is why they are using very primitive, felony people to try to suppress us. You saw yesterday that Britain, BBC was advertising army positions, asking you, even telling you what you can get the bomb to join the Nigerian army. And I know that BBC functions on, on tax, or should I say, licensed fee payers money in the UK. They don't accept any advert. So how come BBC, Pigeon in Nigeria, is advertising for people to join the army of Nigeria for free? Because they are, of course, agents of neocolonialism. They are working for Britain. 
They want Nigerian army ranks to swell up so they can suppress any measure of uprising against the very decaying, crumbling, damnable zoologic, so should I say zoological republic. What our people need to realize is this. What we go through on a daily basis to ensure that our cases are heard all over the world is immense. Everywhere, especially here in the USA. But if the world continues to turn a blind eye and they continue to kill, to rape, to murder, to slaughter people, to take our land, they expect us to put our hands and do nothing. The answer is no, of course, we must fight. Because we have our backs now against the wall, and that's what we're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ohamadike, one of Biafra. Uh, another thing I want to, you know, this is just an introduction to what we are going to discuss this evening. Another thing I want to ask you is that, you know, you, there is a man called Peter uh, Smithers. Peter Smithers, in 1998, in 1998, wrote a Nigeria lesson from Sir Smithers. Sir Smithers said, the negotiation that the Nigeria as a state was a grave mistake. After 40 years, it is clear that this was a grave mistake which has cost many lives and will probably continue to do so. It would have been better to establish several smaller states in a free trade area. The escapation, it must be said, that we did not then have the examples of the collapse of Yugoslavia and of the Soviet Union before our eyes. This was a man who was the parliamentary private secretary to the Minister of State and the Secretary of State in the Colonial Office 1952 to 1959. Can you tell us more about what you feel he is trying to do here? What he's trying to do is to draw our attention to the incompatibility of the various ethnic nationalities you have that make up Nigeria, but more importantly, to draw our attention to the irreducibility of value system in determining who should belong with who in any nation. It's quite interesting that he used Yugoslavia as an example. The funniest thing that people don't understand about Yugoslavia is that they are all one Slavic people. They are all Slavic people as you have with Russia and Bulgaria and all the rest of them. They are all Slavic people. They are one people, one race. They are predominantly Christians. Of course, you have in Bosnia and Herzegovina during the march of Islam into Europe that uh, a few of them became Muslim, as, as you have in some parts of Kosovo and also in Albania. What I am trying to point out is this. These people who are one race, predominantly one religion, cannot live together in a country called Yugoslavia. How about people who are from Senegambia? And goodness knows where else. Not the same language, not the same religion, not the same traditions, not the same culture, absolutely nothing. How can you make these people become one nation is not possible. There is something we've talked about before that most Africans don't seem to pay much attention to. We are tribal animals by nature. Africans are tribal by nature. That is why every Christmas, every New Year festival, every August, we travel back to the village. Even if you live in Kaduna, somebody will ask you, where are you from? You say, I'm from Ijoma. Because that is where your ancestors come from. In Africa, we come from where our ancestors come from. But white Europeans can travel to Australia and they are comfortable. They're from Australia. They can travel to New Zealand. They're from New Zealand. They're okay with it. But even if you take us to New Zealand and we stay there for a million years, if you ask us where we come from, I will come from Ibeko. 
That is something that is very unique to Africa and nobody can take that away from us. And that is something that most people do not understand nor have an appreciation for. That is why in Africa, in everywhere you go to be it in Kenya, in Ethiopia, in South Africa, everywhere, people still talk about tribe till tomorrow morning because we are different. So rather than trying to experiment uh, with us, this sort of very colonial, artificial construct, because mind you, all states in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, are all racist constructs. Those that developed or created Nigeria, that created Togo, that created Ghana, they had racism in mind, not your interest. And this is what we've been trying to explain to African people. If not, why would we go to Lagos during a revolution, or should I say a mini revolution, a protest? And people of Lagos, the people are saying, oh, the Ebos came here to destroy their buildings. But you have all won Nigeria, you claim. These are the things that people need to appreciate. We don't want Fulanese in our land. For the simple reason that we don't want to dilute. Attention, attention. IPOB one family. This now. Can you hear me? Sorry about that. Something it's just... okay. What I'm trying to point out, Simon, is this. Forget about all the one Africa. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a pan-African. But we no. need to start organically. We need to go back to where we come from and begin to build a consensus from the grassroots. When you Biafra want to join Ududua in forming a nation, we look at all the pros and cons. And then reconcile all these things and then we move together as one. Look at Britain that gave Nigeria so that colonized and still owns Nigeria till tomorrow morning. Scotland wants to be on their own. Wales will be on their own very soon. Northern Ireland will need to be on their own. That is human nature. You cannot take it away from us. The only reason why they have Nigeria together the way it is and why we have been complaining and why authors and great commentators like the man you alluded to has not gotten any traction in terms of people being able to understand and appreciate what he's saying is because of the way we reason. I say this all the time. Ule Shoyinka, Professor Ule Shoyinka, um, a, a great literary giant, I would say, came out the other day to say, that he is fed up, or that is war on his doorstep. He knows very well, as an intellectual, so to speak, that the reason why the war is on his doorstep is because Nigeria is flawed. If Udua were to be on their own, do you think somebody will go to, any cow will go to Shoenka's farm to eat the cabbage or the carrots? It won't happen. These are things that we need to understand, that first and foremost, we are tribal animals because life, as we know, is started in Africa. We are attached to the land we come from. That is who we are. Because the white man can be born in England and come to America to settle for life and say he or she is an American doesn't mean we have to follow them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Onyendo. Now, let us look. Let us now go from the fundamental. Fundamental in the sense that, you know, when people are hearing that uh, we are agitating for Biafra, we want Biafra. Some of them in the West, we say the political elite are not uh, shouting Biafra. That, uh, uh, that they are only those who are in diaspora, you know, like civilized ones, are the ones shouting for Biafra. And this is uh, a fact a lot of people don't know. When you look at it, you find out that 99% of people in, in uh, Biafra are shouting Biafra. 99% of Biafrans in Nigeria are shouting for Biafra. Only 1%, not even up to 1% of this so-called elite. These are the politicians that have benefited from Nigeria. Now, I want us to look at how will disintegrated Nigeria favor the region. Before we come into the crisis and the lives that have been lost as a result of trying to keep one Nigeria, can you tell us how do you think that a disintegrated Nigeria will favor the Fulani themselves, the Aousa themselves, the Middle Belt, the Oduduwas, the Biafrans, and any other nation that will want to come out of Nigeria? Explain to us. Let us hear. 
Uh, before we, I came on uh, on this your fantastic program today, I read a very brilliant piece, or should I say a comment, by somebody. The person said that Nigeria is the only place he knows where yesterday is better than today. Hmm. Ask yourself, at which point in Nigeria's history did they record the highest level of human development? It was when they were on their own, when they were semi-autonomous regions. Hmm. So there is an already made example there for people to reference, should they wish to do so. It was when this unitary mindset came into existence that things started to fall apart. So if when you were on your own, the North was doing very well, or the West was doing very well, Papara had the fastest growing economy in the world at nearly 48% every year. Awolowo did his magic in the West. Now tell me, you have a simple example. When people were, should I say, semi-autonomous, or should I say autonomous, so to speak, they were doing very well. Now you are together in one Nigeria. Everything is falling apart to the extent that people are coming from Mali, from Senegambia, from Niger, from Chad, in your backyard, raping and killing you. It is it's a no brain. It's simple common sense. As I said before, that is who we are. Because once you allow an element of stress, an infusion of competition, you get the best out of the people. Right now, we do not have that. Right now, there is no competition. Right now, this thing about one Nigeria, unity, 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 is stifling the creative potentials in us, all of us. Yoruba is not doing well. Biafra is not doing well. Middle Ground is not doing well. The North is not doing well. Nobody is doing well. Then you ask yourself, all these glorious reference to our past, what period was it? The only period was between 1960 to 1965. And then you had returns. Who can argue with that? So the more you separate, the more you look inwards, the more you look at yourself, the more you become self-reliant, the more you, do you know that in those days, all the regions that they had embassies abroad? Do you know that? Do you know the Eastern region had their own embassies abroad with their flag? Are you aware of that? Most mm. people don't know this. And that was the, the time that Nigeria witnessed a semblance of growth in terms of human development. Now you have a very, very, um, um, should I say, disgraceful contraption called One Nigeria. And everybody is struggling. Cows are making your lives a mystery. If you don't know that going back to autonomy is the best way forward, then there is something wrong with that person. Uh, Onyed, thank you very much. Just to, because you know everything we do in Biafra, we stand by the truth. We do everything with evidence and fact. Just to back up what you have just said, I told you about uh, 93 pages of uh, uh, application filed to the ICC. Barely yes. few years, barely few years of formation of uh, of uh, IPOB because this was in 2016. Barely two years. The, uh, the, the foundation of Nigeria were shaken by the formation of IPOB and the, the activity of the IPOB in Nigeria. So on that ground, this application was filed in 2015, uh, 2016 January. So I am bringing it to the, to the screen now for people to see. Uh, for those who are asking, this is number one. The application has been filed 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, and this is 2021, and there is nothing to show for it. And uh, there is a place I'm going, I'm going somewhere with this statement I'm making now, which we are going to discuss, uh, you know, later on in this program. Now, when you read the introduction here, it says, one, this communication is hereby filed to the Office of the Prosecutor, the OTP of the International Criminal Court, the ICC, Boshuan to Article 15 of the Rome Status, the Statute by Professor Goran Slota and Andrew, on behalf of the indigenous people of Biafra, a movement dedicated to self-determination of a former Republic of Biafra in southeastern Nigeria, as well as on behalf of 17 individual citizens of Nigeria, the victims collectively 
will the IPO be the petitioner? Two, the petitioner submit that based on the information set out herein, there is reason to believe that crimes against humanity within the jurisdiction of the ICC, in particular, murder, unlawful imprisonment, torture, enforcement, disappearance, other inhuman act and persecution have been committed in the context of politically and ethnically motivated state violence against primarily IPOB members and the uh, Igbo people of southeastern Nigeria. Due to the absence of, dem of domestic criminal proceedings, with respect to those potentially bearing the greatest responsibility for these crimes, in particular, but not limited to Nigeria current President Mohamed Buhari, and that was then, and in the light of the gravity of the act committed. Now, this is 93 pages, 93 good pages. The list can go on and go on. Factual evidence citations, references, up to 93 good pages. And of course, like you said in the beginning, that you do not want to discuss this thing because a lot have been done and the people are not aware of it. So just to, you know, to, you know, let the public understand, you know, what, uh, what the IPOB have done uh, all this while, when people go on social media to say uh, IPOB under leadership of Mazen Namdikano is uh, doing this or they are not doing that, you know, so this is just one evidence of it that as far back as 2016, you have started taking actions which are necessary, lawful and legal actions against the Nigeria terrorist state. But up to now, nothing is happening. But I'm still going to come back to why I am showing this thing because the actions of today is as a result of the failure of the international community to heed to the call of the Biafra people, of which you have done honorably well in that aspect. So this is just a side uh, comment on what you have said before. Now, going to what you just said about how Nigeria, how it will benefit the other region and the uh, the, uh, the component that makes up Nigeria, how it benefits them when Nigeria is disintegrated. And you may mention of the, what you read that uh, Nigeria of yesterday, that yesterday is better than today. And that is very awkward, awkward uh, fact. You know, very, very awkward fact that every president that comes to Nigeria, the last one will always be better than the new one. It has been, it's not only in the economic sector and all that. But the second question or the third question I want to ask you is this. Now, Looking at what is happening now, a lot of people don't understand what is going on in Nigeria. A lot of people still believe, they, uh, of course, they still believe somehow in Nigeria, you know, they believe that the structure, the political structure of Nigeria is the major problem. And we, people following you, have a different view and a different opinion to this. And I think this is where the interest is clashing. Anybody that is shouting for Nigeria today believe that the problem is in the political structure. We are believing that the problem is not about political structure, but rather there is a motivated or there is a premeditated uh, act to take our land and turn it into Islamic State of, of Lanizos so we are not looking at the aspect of the political structure anymore. It is a, a, a struggle for survival of our people. I want you to shed more light on this because, you know, those supporting one Nigeria must have reason. And the reason what we have seen is that they are thinking that the political structure of Nigeria is the problem of Nigeria. So can you tell us more about, you know, that it is not the political structure, rather something they should know about? Um, thank you, Sam. And it's something they know about that pretend not to know about it. Everybody knows about the hegemonic tendencies of the Fulani Caliphate. We are well versed in the, should I call it, shenanigans of those people who are always expanding. There was a lecture that I gave that the Fulanese are the only people that continues to expand. 
not expand in terms of population, but in terms of territorial influence and supplanting existing cultures and traditions with their own. When we say this thing, people say, oh, you know, yeah, you're warmongering, you're, you're, you're profiling, and it is, it is hate and all the rest of it. And I say it is pure nonsense. Look at the history of the Hausa people. Those of you that want one Nigeria, look at what is happening today in Kanem Brono, the place you call Brono State. Look at the fate of those of them in the Middle Belt. Look at the fate of those of them, our brothers and sisters in Yoruba land, Yoruba. Even the caliphate left their footprint there many, many years ago in Quara State. Many years ago, they overran Nupe people of Niger State. Many years ago, some of you don't know this. They forcibly, they forcibly tried to convert the Atta of a Gala to Islam. These things are there in our history books. They are everywhere. If one Nigeria means that our land should be surrendered to people from Senegambia, then death is a better option because it's not going to happen. We are the Biafran people, and within that Biafra, it contains a very unique race in the world called the Iwaris. Very, They are very difficult, don't get me wrong, but they are very unique. Very, very unique. I don't think anybody is more stubborn than we are. I don't think anybody is more generous than we are. I do not believe that any race on this earth is more affluent in terms of natural blessing than we are. Anybody thinking they can use the guise of one Nigeria to take the land of our ancestors, that person is dreaming. Them and their cohorts, they are dreaming. And I will tell you why they are dreaming. They have tried before, over 300 years ago, to take that very land. They failed. Islam made it to the sea across West Africa. Islam made it to the Atlantic Ocean. The only place that Islam did not succeed in penetrating is the East. And when they came for that very jihad, we, did, we had no army at all. God Almighty in heaven took over the and put it behind the fort for us. All their armies died. That thing they tried in Kwara State and succeeded. They tried it in Lower Benue, in Idoma and Igre lands, and they failed. All their armies died. The few that survived. By Ekene Muno, on a noble course, Yaga. Open the fine men are due no more. Kabaru came to the share button and share it immediately. Alright, once again, don't forget that this is Eastern News 24. We have given you the latest news on what is happening in Biafra land. The thing, the deep secret you need to know, you will get it at Eastern News 24. Alright, open the final name and I do know Kabalo comment on this particular audio clip. Igelo, but our leader and the man Simon, but the Odogu Biafra in exile. The, uh, uh, the Biafra Prime Minister in exile. Then also, don't forget um, to stay tuned. This is the part one. Uh, this is the part one. We get up to part two and part three. After all this part, you will not understand what Mazi Simon Eba is doing. You will not understand the secret behind what he's doing. And the man could just hear also. All right, thank you. Stay tuned at Eastern News 24. Okay, Messiah and the bye.